Good? All right. How's everybody doing? All right. Last talk of the day. Last talk of the day. Everybody learned something today? Who didn't learn anything today? All right, good. So it wasn't a waste of your time to come. So good. My name is Russell Butterini. This is Josh Tower. Let's give Josh a hand. This is his first time talking at a security con. So, uh, so I've set the bar low for you now. So if this goes really badly, uh, this is Skitty Monkeys fling stuff at your defenses and see what sticks. This slide went through several iterations to find a David Lipscomb appropriate uh, version that we could use for the title of the talk because uh, I really wasn't sure how um, conservative we were here. So um, I hate writing slides, the who, who am I, who we are slide. I, I've talked to a lot of these things. I finally was like, I'm going to write slides like who I'm not. Uh, we are not the founders and CEOs of Insert Cool Name Security. Uh, it seems like when you go to a lot of these cons, particularly that one out west, everybody who gets to talk is the founder and CEO of Cyber Deathmatch Blackpool <laughs> Secret Security. Um, and, uh, you know, that's great. If you can do that and you have a real company, that's awesome. Just It's hard to sometimes tell if these are real companies or not. Uh, we're not consultants. Uh, we don't work for Acuvant, unlike a lot of people. Uh, and we're not selling anything. Uh, what we do is we work for one of the plethora of healthcare companies here in Nashville, Franklin, and um, we break our stuff, we attack it, we defend it, and we have mortgages to pay, so we'll keep doing that for the foreseeable future. Josh, you want to add anything? I think you got it. I think I got it? All right. So where did this talk come from? Um, right after DerbyCon last year, Dave Shackelford, who's somebody I really uh, really have a lot of respect for, wrote a, wrote a blog post, and he said, if you can't protect a freaking port scan, let alone a DNSC2 channel, why are you waiting hours in line to hear talk about hijacking car internals? I think it's a very, very good point. And, um, you know, Dave's right. Car hacking is important. That's what's going to save lives, but it's not what 99% of us should be focusing on, particularly if your employer is paying for you to be somewhere, right? We need tools, we need talks about like how do we detect things. There were a lot of great talks. Who are some of the blue track talks this morning? Uh, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. You can admit to it. It's okay to be on the blue and the red track, you know. Uh, we're not racist here. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's good. I got a laugh from Willie. That's good. If I get one laugh from Willie per talk. Uh, no, I mean, you know, we, we don't have enough talks about detecting bad stuff happening in our networks. We don't have enough bad talks that are teaching you, like, hey, let's figure out what's going on. And then and we do have talks about hacking plastic things we find in our garages. There are people, you know, Paul Asadorian, who do that very well. There are a lot of people who, you know, I put Linux on my baby monitor. You know, that's, <laughs> for what that's worth, I don't think it warrants a talk at a security con. And, and then there's a lot of talks when we do cover these things, you don't get tools to take home with you to, you know, continue learning, continue to assess where you are. And so that's what we're going to try to give you today. We're going to try to give you some ideas about why I think we have gaps in how we simulate, how we get ready for attacks, and um, give you some tools to take home where you can kind of find those gaps. So now that I'm off my soapbox about security cons and people who start companies and other things like that, let's talk about attackers. This picture really is not showing up very well. What this is, is this is actually a... Um, Actually, cut, cut that light, Josh, if you don't mind. I forgot they told me to do that, and uh, I, I completely forgot. Good job. That's what Josh was up here for. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about attackers. And, and this is actually a picture of a monkey trainer uh, in China who was uh, beating his monkeys, and the monkeys turned on him. And as you can see, one of them actually has the stick he was beating him with. Uh, but these guys, I started thinking, like, these guys would be the greatest attackers ever, right? Because... Um, in terms of like cyber attackers, because you've got, they're using a variety of sticks. One's using sheer brute force to beat the guy over the head with the stick. Another guy is, you know, another monkey's being a little selective. He's biting. He's going for the hand. And then you've got a third monkey who's sitting there just sitting back waiting for his chance to strike after he watches what the other guys do. So I thought it was a perfect analogy for attackers. And this is a monkey theme talk, as you can tell, and you guys will get why in a minute. But uh, yeah, I'm not really just obsessed with monkeys or anything like that. Um, so how real life works when we get attacks. And if you're in this room, I hope this is not news to you. If it is, then you know maybe we'll learn something here. Uh, attackers can come in from any point on the network, right? <clears throat> what we say a few years ago, we said the perimeter's dead. So we're not as worried about the data center. We're not as worried about 
the HQ, whatever it may be. Now we've got teleworkers, we've got, you know, branch offices, we've got VPNs to our partners, we've got all these different network segments, right? And there's not this one centralized place we're trying to defend. Any of these things can be attacked, any of these things can be a source of attack for us, right? Um, compromise very rarely involves one machine. So one machine is where it starts, but usually it spreads to multiple machines, and each compromised machine probably has some connection. So whether it's a you know one guy, a nation state, organized crime, whatever attacking you, right? They're gonna take the knowledge as they move through the network one point and they're gonna apply it to other points on the network as they compromise other machines. So there's gonna be some shared uh, pool of uh, knowledge about um, but what's going on in your network and what to attack. And then we have to prepare for all different sophistication levels. Getting really, really good and really tuned in our IPS and our uh, event monitoring for a, a super cyber China APT malware attack if we somehow turn off the rules for basic port scans and other things and script kitty type attacks really doesn't help us a lot because those guys eventually will get lucky and get in, right? So. So we wrote this man a big check, and he came and did a pen test for us. Uh, this is John Strand. Uh, he is almost as crazy as that picture makes him look. Uh, this is his picture from Twitter, by the way. Uh, and uh, I like John. Uh, John, I, let get off on a tangent. John runs a company called Black Hills InfoSec. They do excellent, excellent work. If you need a pen test, web app test, social engineering, incident response. Uh, gosh, I don't know. They've done a million things where Josh and I work for us. We've been really, really happy with them. If you guys, you know, blackhillsinfosec.com, a quick plug for John. But we wrote him a check. He did a pen test. That's exactly what a real attack would be like. Man, they came in, they plugged their laptop in, they ran around the network, and, you know, they told us all these things we have to fix, and, and that's exactly what it's going to be like when somebody attacks us. Like, well, yeah, I've heard that before. Not about John's company, but about other companies and John's company in general. Or if it's one of the pen tests, Puppy Mills. They came in, they ran Nessus, they gave us this big report, you know, they put their logo on top of it. It was awesome. It cost $35,000. It must have been good. We're all ready for a real attack now, right? Yeah. I think it's a great exercise. I think everybody should have pen testing done. I think that um, I think any company should go through it. You'll find things you didn't know about, um, but it's not equal to what it's going to be like when real world acti malicious activity occurs. If you're using this as a practice, then it's a waste of money. What you need to do when you're having a pen test is give them all the resources they need to find the maximum number of risks, and I want us particularly to pay attention to the part in red here. Given limited time, money, and resources, right? So when we have a pen tester, you get what? You're one guy who comes on site. You only have so much money you can devote to the project, and he can only be there for a certain amount of time before he's gonna move to the next thing. And we'll talk about this a little more, but do attackers have those limitations and constraints on them? Not so much, right? So. We can't use this as a simulation. Now, we, maybe as a byproduct of the test, we find out like, hey, our IPS didn't see this or did see this. Um, you know, we shouldn't be using like, these tests to find out if our antivirus is working, which is probably not, as you guys know, I'm sure. We shouldn't be using it to find out if our third-party SOC is paying attention, which, unless George is working there, they're probably not paying attention. Um, you know, that, so, so this is not what we do. Pen tests should be about identifying risks. They should be about mitigating those risks, discovering potential damage so you can prioritize those risks. And then the other part of this is how often can we do a pen test? It, you know, maybe you're lucky enough to have an internal red team who can do it quarterly, maybe, uh, depending on how big your enterprise is. If you don't have a, who, who in here doesn't have like an internal red team or a hacking guy? How often do you guys get to do a penetration test? Once a year? Once a year? Okay. Ever? Never? Sometimes when you can afford it, yeah, when you get the budget, yeah, sure. So what do we do in the meantime to assess these controls outside that one time a year the guy comes on site or you know when you get around to it, right? So the first problem, and it's not a problem, when I say problems with pen tests, like I said, I love pen testing. I don't think pen testing is problematic. I just think in terms of simulating a real attack, it's problematic, is location. This is not our data center, although it looks like some parts of it. Uh, but um, we have all these IP connected things now, right? So location. We have lots of IP connected things. We have phone systems. We have HVAC systems. We have, you know, I, you guys know, I mean, everything. It's the Internet of Things, right? Are connected to the network. So, and they're all in probably, like we said, we're very decentralized. So they're in people's houses. They're in uh, your data center. They're in your branch office. They're in the hotel where the sales guy's staying, right? 
So we have all these dis disjointed network segments, right? And it's really impossible to get red teams everywhere in the network to start attacking things or launching attacks from. So that being the case, how do we know we've got those things covered by IPS, by appropriate firewall rules, by uh, you know, I know, SIM monitoring, uh, net flow detection, some things we talked about earlier, right? It's in the blue track. Um, it's, it's just impossible. Now, I mean, and I put the comment in like the HVAC systems network segment, not that that's ever bitten anybody before target, uh, but um, most likely you get a pen test guy to come in or your, your internal red team. They're going to sit in their area and they're going to do their work and they're going to launch off in the area or they're going to their server that has all tools on it. And that's great. Like I said, it, it helps you identify risk. But it's not a simulation. Second problem is methodology. So in a pen test, they're going to go through a very structured methodology, right? They're going to do the target scoping. They're going to gather information. They're going to map vulnerabilities, do port scans, social engineering, whatever, right? Is this how automated malware works? Who thinks this is how automated malware works? Who thinks this is how real attackers work? Right? It's swing, hit what you can, and then, you know, this guy, I guess he probably lost the diagram or fail, and he failed the CEH exam, but you know, I mean, or those guys helped him cheat. Maybe he's taking the test right there and they're answering the questions for him. I don't know. Um, but what are they going to do? They're moving in a very unstructured fashion, right? They're going to hit targets multiple times. They may not hit some targets at all. So if the guy's sitting on your network with, you know, doing the pen testing, he's running Nessus or whatever, and it's going to like run, it's do the port scan, it's going to do the enumeration, it's going to find the map, the vulnerabilities, then it's going to go to the next target. It's not really like, Malware, right? It's, so, again, how do we get ready for that sort of thing? Problem with pen test number three, resource constraints. This will be the guy you would get. That's a picture of Josh, actually, from a couple months ago. Um, I work him pretty hard. So, uh, <laughs> so you're gonna get this guy, right? And he's, he's uh, only got, you know, whatever company he's coming from, he's only got so many people. Uh, he's only got so much time. He's probably working on multiple things. You can only afford to pay for it. We were talking about some of this. Financial constraints, time constraints, people constraints. You can't be everywhere. Attackers aren't as constrained. And we can only afford this guy once a year, once a quarter, right? So how do we solve these problems? And since I bagged on pen tests for a little while, I felt obligated to talk about outsourced security monitoring, which is another one of my favorite topics. Um, and like I said, I'm not bagging on pen tests, but just as a simulation. Um, in full, interest full disclosure, I despise outsourcing of all forms. Um, I've worked for an outsourcer. I've worked against an outsourcer. We call it against. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and Jack, I have a quote from you here. Uh, don't outsource your core competency, especially if it's failure. Uh, and um, outsource socks are going to try to come at the lowest price point, unless George works there, right? Because when you guys monitor stuff, you do everything right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I figured, you know, yeah. So, But these guys operate on razor-thin margins. And the more customization they have to do for you, the more stuff they got to monitor your network, the more people it takes, the less their profit margin is. So, uh, you know, it's probably going to work for about 80%. The last 20%, they hope they get lucky and stumble over. And I've actually, working for an outsourcer, had that statement made to me by, and I will not tell you which outsourcer that was, but nobody you ever heard of. But, uh, yeah, they, they basically hope you get an 80% solution in, and then you get lucky on the last 20 so how do you get assurance that they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing, that they're paying attention, they're calling you when weird things happen in the network, things go bump in the night? How do you audit that? Because you probably, you have your little console and it's got the beautiful graphs and the lines and the charts and you can see all this, and, but how do you know that's everything? So what we need is bad guy simulators. We have another monkey slide. Who knows this movie? What movie is that? Um, I remember watching it. Project X, thank you. I was curious who. That was one of my favorite movies. They, the uh, United States is, uh, Air Force is training monkeys to go bomb the Soviets, and the idea is they would drop the bomb, they don't have to get out because and they just get radiated and die. And Matthew Broderick found that offensive. Um, so, so we need bad guy simulators. And I started thinking about this problem, and I came back to something that you know my boss was talking about a couple of uh, years ago about Netflix Chaos Monkeys. And this is a, a DevOps type tool which uh, Netflix actually open sources. And the idea behind the Chaos Monkeys is that they go and they break stuff in your Amazon instances. And if 
you, you want to find out basically if something goes down, an instance goes down, a service goes down, or whatever, can your app survive? Can your app self heal? And I, and I like the quote, failures happen and they inevitably happen when least desired or expected. If your application can't tolerate an instance failure, would you rather find out by being paged at 3 a.m. or when you're in the office and have had your morning coffee? So I started thinking about that and I was like, well, how do we apply that to security, right? So we took Chaos Monkeys and we built Skitty Monkeys, and this is the release party for Skitty Monkeys 0.1, so the monkeys are happy. They've got their party hats on, and uh, they're, they're excited. Um, oh, gosh, I'm doing terrific on time. We can actually talk about a lot of other gripes I have. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I took that quote, and I changed it. And there's the website. The website will be uh, at the end, too. That actually goes to a page with the GitHub uh, for the source code and some really, really awful documentation I wrote in about two hours the other day. Um, but I took the quote and changed it to apply to security. Malicious activities happen, and they inevitably it happen when least desired or expected. If your application internal system with all your juiciest data can't tolerate a port scan, port fuzz, brute force log, an exploit attempt, and your detective controls can't see it, would you rather find out by being breached or when you're in the office and had had your morning coffee? And I'm sure we all have the same answer to that question. But uh, Skitty Monkey's idea is to provide a semi, and I say semi because I started on with a Windows background, so if you don't go next, 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 finish, then to me it's too hard. I have a nice certificate that says I'm a Microsoft certified solitaire expert on Windows 2000 uh, hanging on my wall at home. Uh, but uh, it's a semi-easy way to deploy distributed automated testing systems to gauge the effectiveness of your defective preventative controls and identify gaps. So what we've done... Josh and I have written a client server architecture that allows you to deploy simulated bad actors at any point in your network and the client issues them bad things to go do, then they go do them and you get a report of here's what I did, here's what IP it was, here's what port, here's what time it started, here's what time it ended. You go back to your detective controls and say, or your third party SOC or the guy who's supposed to be watching and you say, show me where you saw all this stuff. And we're going to do a demo of that here in a minute. But first we're going to talk a little bit about the outlying architecture. So monkey recipe, things you'll need. Kali Linuxes already have everything installed, uh, or time patient to install security tools and get a working Metasploit Postgres instance. Uh, those of you who have installed Metasploit may know to get a working Postgres instance involves a lot of pain if you're using the Git uh, version of Metasploit, or you can sign a little piece of paper that says, I'm going to have a Rapid7 salesperson call me every day for the rest of my life, uh, and um, and you can download their package, which installs everything for you, and it's, it's very clean. Um, a default installation of MongoDB, which is kind of funny because I spent most of last year talking about why MongoDB stinks from a security perspective, but it's really just because I'm super lazy and I code badly and I write things that and think, oh man, I should have put that in later. And MongoDB will let you dynamically change the schema without uh, complaining too much. So uh, you need MongoDB that all the monkey servers and client can reach. So all these bad actors we're going to deploy onto our network are going to write what they're doing back into this Mongo database. The client's going to write configuration settings and so forth and also pull its reporting data out of it. So we'll have distributed bad actors. Everybody can reach it. Everybody writes the data in so we find out what everybody's doing. Uh, TCP 7433, uh, that, I made that up because that kind of spells tree if you squint real hard. Uh, monkey's tree, you get it. I'm just, uh, I'm full of jokes today. Uh, it has to be open between the monkey servers and the monkey client. And uh, I, you know, I'm in security, and all of us are supposed to hate the cloud, uh, as, as we all know, and the cloud actually works really well for pretty much all of this. So, um, Then we have monkey food. So our clients ingest target files, which are simple CSV files defining what they should instruct the monkey service to attack. Um, format's real simple. IP address, and then you're going to find a value for each target. One, two, or three. The more valuable the target, you know, the, the juicier the data is, the more likely the smarter monkeys are to attack it. Uh, and then, and this is something that I'm going to change in the next release of this. Uh, right now I just said I for an internal monkey or E for an external monkey. The idea we can have internal and external actors happening at the same time, which hopefully is useful to people. But I'm actually probably going to change that next release to it's whatever you want. And um, all that is used for is as you define your servers, they're assigned to either an I or an E zone, but it really could be defined, assigned to the HVAC zone or the PCI zone or the production zone or whatever. And then, and that's how the monkeys decide what they're going to attack is based on what zone they're in. Um, so monkey species. Uh, scan monkey. And if you've never run against a set of targets before, one is always required. Now, 
We talked about intelligence sharing a little bit, right? So we talked about how multiple machines, they're going to share intelligence, what they're finding on the network, so forth. The scan monkey is what feeds targets and target data to the uh, other monkeys. So port scanner, he, if you vary the scan monkey's intelligence a little bit, he will actually vary his tactics to a really dumb monkey, uses loud scanning. The smarter monkeys, and I have some hilarious names for the various IQ levels that you'll see here in a minute, uh, they'll actually try to make their scan techniques a little more stealthy. Uh, exploit monkeys will launch random exploits with random payloads based on open ports and random target. I said I'm still picking the lice out of this one. Rapid7 kind of messed me up right before I came here by deprecating MSFCLI, which worked really, really well for scripted Metasploit things. And now they want you to punt everything to MSF console, which is slow and Python multi-threading hates. And so this is not in production yet. Actually, it is, but it just won't work if you try it. So, uh, fuzzy monkey. So, you actually, if you create a fuzzy monkey server, you, it will fuzz ports with random data. So, basically, it just pulls random blocks of stuff. You say, I want it between this much stuff and this much stuff. It picks a random value and uh, sends that data toward that open port on a server. So, maybe those of you who were in some of the NetFlow talks earlier, if we can see, if we know what a normal transaction looks like and all of a sudden something on the network starts sending large abnormal transactions, then this might be a use for that. Uh, WebMonkey is simply a web app directory brute forcer. It'll pick up the web servers that the scan monkey send it and say, and go after directories. And uh, login monkey is a login brute forcer. This is just the start. This is all built to be very modular. So over time, if either you download the code and you create your own monkeys and want to plug them in or do something different or please, please, please submit them back to GitHub because there are so many cool things that, you, that could be done here and I've got some ideas, but this was just sort of a, a basic framework to get the project started. Um, so, uh, Monkey Smarts, uh, and I'm going to let Josh explain a little bit about this because he does math and I don't. Um, monkeys can vary in how intelligent they are. So, Monkey uh, IQ Zero is the world's number one hacker, aka Gregory Evans, uh, to number three, who's a Security Weekly listener. So, the smartest monkeys listen to Security Weekly. Jack. So, uh, smarter scan monkeys will use more complex and stealthier port scan techniques, and then getting off the ground for um, the other monkeys. Right now, the, what they use the IQ for is deciding what to attack. And Josh, you want to kind of talk about how that works a little bit? Yeah. Unclip myself. Do you want to talk into my chest? Yeah. Oh, we've been working together a year. It's uh, time we took it to the next level. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the the monkey IQ, um, it's uh, used within the de uh, decision of, of what targets to go after, and that's based off of mon monkey IQ, uh, the priority of the target, uh, a little bit of randomness because we still want this to be a little bit chaotic, uh, as well as the um, frequency that that target has already been hit. So if it if it's been relatively ignored up to this point, I might want to go for that one first. Uh, and that's just a, a good baseline of um, making sure that all the targets are attacked evenly um, and with the priority of the targets being factored in as well. And the, the smarter monkeys obviously will go after the, the better targets most of the time, um, while the dumb monkeys is just kind of grab bag whatever. Right. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. He's single, ladies. <laughs> uh. So... Uh, so yeah, so like Josh was explaining, you know, we have values for the targets. We saw that in the the, monk, the target file that uh, we talked about earlier. Um, smarter monkeys will always go after, or will most of the time, because there is still that degree of randomness, like Josh said, go after where the best targets are. Um, dumber monkeys will have more of a tendency just to take wild swings at things and you know be happy with whatever they hit. Um, so this is my fabulous architecture diagram. So uh, I spent way too much time on this. Uh, so we have the boss monkey in the shirt and tie there at the top. That's your monkey client. Um, he's going to actually be used to assign work to these various monkeys. And, like, and this is a really bad way of, of showing this, but they're internal monkeys, they're external monkeys. The idea is you can have things on one side of the firewall, you can have things on the other side of the firewall. They can all be conducting bad actions at the same time. You can run multiple monkeys on one machine. You can have multiple different machines with monkeys on them. It's very, very modular. And that's the whole idea is to be able to create as simple or as complex an attack as you want to uh, gauge your controls. So as you see, the, the client monkey gives them work. 
Uh, the internal monkeys go and they do bad things and cut stuff up on your network and their ski masks uh, or their hockey masks. And uh, then they actually report the data, the bad action data they did back into the MongoDB. The end of what I call the monkey shift, the uh, Monkey client goes and he pulls a report to find out what all they did and then gives it to you and then you guys go and fix your stuff. So um, without further ado, uh, Josh is going to do the uh, demo now for us. And I'd like to point out that since this is Josh's first time presenting a security con, as part of his hazing, I'm making him do a demo of a piece of software that uses only random actions so we have no idea what it's going to do when he starts demoing. <laughs> so. Yeah, thanks for that, by the way. Yeah, yeah you're very welcome. All right, so just out of curiosity, uh, there was an open source talk earlier today. Was anyone in this room in that talk as well? Show of hands. All right, a couple of people. Uh, so what was the uh, best way to contribute to a project if you're not necessarily a coder that was mentioned several, several times? Hmm? But documentation, hurry over there. Uh, so that's, uh, Russ wasn't in that talk, so um, his quote unquote bad documentation is going to reflect that. We will. Uh, Hopefully get some people helping out with that later on. I, I too, am not very gr uh, great at grammar or English or sentence structure, so um, I can help, but it won't be very, uh, won't be very good. That's true. English is hard. English is hard. Shh. All right, so this is the, the command line interface that uh, Russell um, mentioned before. So if you're not using the web interface, this is what you would see. And this has the same basic flow uh, as the web interface does. You set up your database, uh, that's your, your Mongo backend, and um, Metasploit mo modules that you want to load in for the uh, exploit monkey. Uh, you uh, pass in that target file for load targets to find your monkeys, unleash them, uh, and get a report of that. So we won't actually use that one today. Hey, make sure your server started, Josh. I'll make this server started. All right, now it is. Yeah. So we have two machines. One is going to function as the client. One is function as the bad actor. And that's what Josh was starting in his office in 4733. I wrote this really crappy command line interface, or uh, menu-based interface, and Josh wrote a really excellent web server so, uh, as, as well. So we're going to show you the web server. And if it goes horribly wrong, we actually have a video of it working. See if we can prove it work at least once. <laughs> Hopefully, anyway. <coughs> All right, so it actually looks pretty okay on here. Uh, so this is the uh, main client page. This is where you would set up your, your database information, your, um, your MongoDB that you're running against. Um, a lot of this uh, is just pre-populated from uh, previous runs and uh, Helps keep everything organized so you, you know which IPs you're going after. So we'll change this to MonkeyDB. And where's that target file, Russell? It's your machine? Yeah. Oh, you're in the wrong, you're wrong folder. It's in the home folder. Ah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. And then, then go to the skinny monkeys and pull it in there. Should have targets on that side there. We can take it before. There you go. All right, so this is in the same format that Russell was showing earlier. Um, and we'll go ahead and erase existing targets just so that we start with uh, just what we want. It's important to note that when you set all this stuff up, all things we're doing today, you only have to do it once because it's written in the database. So as long as you're using the same database name, the same database server, and over and over, you can run multiple attacks, different combinations of monkeys, whatever, and keep all the data in the same database. The other thing is this this side of it, the Metasploit settings, uh, for the thing that's not working right now, uh, this actually will open the Metasploit Postgres database and pull out all the exploits and map them to ports. Uh, that's a, it's a really ugly method of doing it because amazingly the Metasploit Postgres database doesn't contain mappings of, of exploits to ports or default ports. 
uh, which is gross because this will actually get the file names out of the Postgres database, open them up, search the code for the port numbers reference to the code, which isn't on every exploit for whatever reason, and then uh, write them back into the MongoDB with the exploit file names written to the ports. And then MSF console, MSF CLI will run them sometimes. So. Right. So, okay. So now that we have uh, our database information set up, um, we can find our monkeys over here. Uh, since I used a different database name, uh, we don't have any currently set up. And just to make sure that I'm using the right IPs. They might not have changed. Or am I just setting Josh up? I believe the second over the first. <laughs> All right, so as Russell mentioned before, uh, you have different monkey IQs. Uh, so world's number one hacker, CISSP, CEH, Security Weekly list Listener. No, Security Weekly Listener is smarter than all below. Right, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and we'll, we'll do a little bit higher so it uses uh, some, some better targets uh, or better flags. The IQ4 uh, we're doing the, the scanner monkey first. Um, so these next two fields we can ignore. Those are for the fuzzy monkey, um, determined with a minimum and maximum bytes to send are. Uh, we're going to leave an internal location. So in our targets file for this demo, we only have one target to find, which is a Metasploit. It just works really well because it has lots of services and ports and things over on yeah, and we'll go ahead and make a couple more. Uh, so have, yes, if we only have one target, the IQ is really not tremendously relevant. So you guys get the idea. You could have massive amounts of targets. There isn't a CLI version for Josh. Josh um, work on his user experience. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I have th I have thought about it, and I'm working on it. Uh, so in future iterations, hopefully you'll see a nice little table underneath that shows what current current monkeys you have listed, and be able to remove or um, delete them all as needed. So use the CLI version or learn MongoDB, so you can go in there and see what's up. Yeah. All right, so now we have our targets, uh, we have our monkey set up. Um, the only thing left really to do is to release them. So you, you set up the, the number of minutes, uh, we'll go with five, um, just keep it running. Now, uh, Russell mentioned earlier that the, um, that the report will generate when you finish and present it to you. Um, in my version, you can actually uh, check them as they run, assuming they run. You put the wrong IP in for the server, I bet. Mm, that's true. All right, try this again. Okay, things are now happening. So uh, currently the, the port scan is gonna need to run first, so everything else is gonna wait to get that information back. Um, and as soon as that port scan finishes, we should see that uh, the results will start to populate in here. So, so yeah, so we're doing this all on one machine. So you see we actually got three connections, one for each type of monkey that Josh defines that's multi-threaded, so that just starts a new thread each time you set an instruction. Um, what will happen, because the other monkeys are dependent on the services discovered in the port scan, they'll sit and query the database to see if there's any targets that have ports that have been discovered in their zone. Remember we had I for internal, E for external. So they'll sit periodically. If they don't see anything, they wait 10 seconds, then they'll try it again. This has been taking about two minutes to run since we're demoing it live for you. It's probably going to take about 20. Uh, but uh, hopefully this will, this will finish up in a minute. Is there any questions, comments, cuss words while we're, oh, you can't say those here, uh, while we're uh, waiting for this to finish? Pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, comment. We already mentioned maybe having a table or something where you can see the list of uh, monkeys. Mm -hmm. um, 
Also, another uh, input validation concept, when you inputted the IP for the server and you checked it go, but there wasn't a server there, perhaps some kind of check that says, hey, there's no server waiting on that IP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's input validation? My developers don't do that. I know. So I, I assume you didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I learned everything I know from them. This is still scanning the other IP address that we could have Correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, it's, yeah, we could actually do a TCP dump from it uh, if we really wanted to be cool. But um, what we like to do is we'll get a message that says, like, it's done, and then you'll see the other monkeys start working. Uh, this is where it probably would be better to use the movie instead of, uh, or the recording instead of uh, a live demo, because then we could just fast forward to this part. Um, you guys are just impatient. Good question. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I know what the exploit is, but not, I don't use it yet. Okay. When you run the exploitation process, does it actually does it just show you the results of the exploit was successful, or does it actually it could potentially take down the machine in the process? That, that is a really good question. For this iteration, we decided to only focus on that the event occurred. Okay, so I mean, somebody sling a mess exploit exploit around your network, that's bad enough, right? We don't really care if it's successful, unsuccessful. Something's wrong, right? Somebody's like report scan, somebody's like fuzzing ports. Those things are bad enough. You know, we, we don't really care about this. Now, for future iterations, yeah, we're going to do exactly what you suggested, which was, hey, let's let's record this. And one of the other ideas is we talk about the shared intelligence. So we're having, you know, if monkey A finds some exploit worked, or monkey A found some set of credentials that worked. Now the other monkeys on the network can start using that data to launch more advanced attacks. So, so. could you potentially have an option to have uh, check only or check and execute? Because you right. may want to let your AV or some type of IDS, whatever <coughs> uh, security product you're using, see if it actually sees the attack occurring and then stops it. You see if you can test your AV product. And see if it actually stops it at that point. Right. No, no, that's actually a really good idea. Yeah. So those types of things we can do. So yeah, so we see that actually the port scan finished just now. And you see now that we actually have ports populated for the target machine, we have you know, we see the fuzzy monkey started and he's sending 30 bytes a day. I don't know what range Josh put in. Uh, and then we see the brute monkey started because he found some ports open as well, but this targets both these zones. And so, uh, Josh, why don't you go back to the web console and see, uh, see what we got now in the results. So you see now we've actually got this report showing, okay, a port scan occurred, here's the source IP, here's the target. We don't worry about the port, because it's all the ports, right? It's port scan, here's when it started, here's when it finished. Okay, we've got a port fuzzing occurred, you know, source, destination, here's the port the fuzz occurred on, here's how many bytes were sent. So we can take all this stuff back and, um, you know, we have the HTML table here. If you do this from the command line, okay, there's an SSH brute force attack that tried to occur. I actually shortened the list. That's another good thing to mention. I have several canned lists uh, that came from, I think, Pentest Geek or somewhere like that for directory brute forcing and um, credential brute forcing, things like that. So if um, you want to put your own list in, the path is in the documentation. The instructions are named in these files. This is the format the files need to take, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, it, this is all very customizable. If you do this from a CLI interface, we have the table here. Uh, the CLI interface actually will dump into a CSV file that you can open in Excel. You can do all those things people do in Excel. I got keys in every class I had in Excel, so I don't know what you can do. You know. But you can, what are those words that, like, Bob, use, like pivot tables, mm -hmm. graphs? <laughs> I, I don't know. So, so, yeah, so you, but you get a little more of a, a set of data you can do analytics on. Yeah, yeah. Do what? You have to be a manager or something. I heard there's a certification that is like Microsoft Office user special. <laughs> <laughs> a, a mouse. A mouse. A yes. mouse. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so I mean, that, but you guys get the idea, right? And uh, this will run basically, uh, I think, what do you give five minutes or something like that, Josh? We don't have to do the whole five minutes. Uh, at the end, when it's done, it gives you a little message that says the monkey ship is over. Uh, so, you know, so George and I were talking about actually uh, earlier. You take this, we think about all the things we saw in the blue team talks, right? Uh, about, you know, flow analytics. We can say, all right, now we have, uh, let's do a uh, now we have a set of data that we know is like good, our normal network traffic. We have a set of data that was bad because we, and we know it was bad because we generated it. Now we can start looking for anomalies and knowing what those anomalies are going to look like because really, all those graphs and stuff are great, but until something bad happens on your network, you're not going to know what it looks like for something bad to happen. Oh, George has a question. Okay, we're also back here talking to you that 
Mongo TV, you can take your set blog product or <laughs> blog whatever else, pull the data that these guys are generating, and then have it actually correlate that against your real logs and right. your logging solution. Right. And if you don't see the activity that these reported is having done in your real logs, you know somebody isn't sending you the logs or something. Right, exactly. So, um, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Sure. Can you try unleashing your monkeys on the server? On what, the server itself? Or? Yeah. Probably try that. It would, it would probably <laughs> crash. <laughs> <laughs> It crashes for a lot of other reasons right now, so <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. So um, we did. I had like two more slides, Josh. If that's so. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if, I was actually going to do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No <laughs> so, well, we do. We do have. Oh, we got twenty minutes, but uh, I'd rather not demonstrate. Oh, there we go. I'm so loud. I forgot I didn't have the microphone. How sad is that? It's called being a child of the hair metal generation. Uh, Okay. So yeah, and we already talked about some of the stuff I'm going to wrap up with here. Uh, the future, we want to build more monkeys. We want to, you know, just some rough ideas I had. Um, an exfiltration monkey, let's you know, give the monkey some files and somewhere to upload them to. See if your DLP picks it up as it leaves the network. Uh, pivot monkey, you know, more important than brute force login, see if something has some valid creds and give it a bunch of machines to log into. See if you can find odd patterns of successful logins in your network. Um, Pre-rolling the monkeys into VMs or, I don't know, Raspberry Pi images or something, because this will run on about anything. The only thing that has a weird dependency is, or not a lot of architecture support, is MongoDB. Uh, I had a friend who got it running on an Android device uh, earlier this week. I mean, so there's really not a lot of complicated Python dependencies or anything. There's a setup script that'll actually install them all for you using pip. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, you know, the idea, again, it's supposed to be easy to deploy so we can get in different network segments and make it easier. And then the last thing, which you talked about, was letting users define zones, building more complex monkey rules, saying a monkey in zone A can attack things in zone B and zone C, but not things in zone D versus, you know, monkeys in zone C can attack things in zone A, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, like I said, there's the website, uh, the source code is there, bad documentation is there. If you have questions, comments, complaints, it, it's 0 0.1, it has lots and lots of bugs, there's not a lot of input validation, and, and there's other things that are missing. We're going to be working on it. It's a project that um, I think we're both pretty excited about. I think people will find it useful. Um, it, is this useful stuff? You guys think this is useful stuff? Um, you know, if you find bugs and want to fix them, uh, I am like the world's worst at reviewing uh, bug fix commits to GitHub, so I usually just like, oh yeah, let's push that in. That guy probably knows more than me, so I'll probably push in GitHub if you fix stuff. And um, unless there's more questions or whatever, we'll wrap it up and uh, I guess go to, what is it, Belcourt Taps and have some fun. So, all right? Thank you. Thanks, guys.